Hello and welcome to my school channel. My name is Angela and in this video we are going to continue the government topic by topic video lesson. So for this video lesson we are going to move on to the topic basic principles of government where we are going to be discussing the foundational principles that guide the workings of government. So I have divided this video lesson into two segments. In the first segment we are going to discuss foundational principles like the rule of law, fundamental human rights, liberty, separation of power and checks and balances. Please stay with us, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the My School channel. Like I said earlier, we're going to be discussing the basic principles of government. So let's dive right into it. Alright, so for this video lesson, these are the principles of government that we're going to be discussing. So for this first video, we're going to discuss the rule of law, fundamental human rights, liberty, separation of powers, and checks and balances. So let's start. Alright, so governments worldwide are shaped by foundational principles that guide their structure, functions, and relationships with citizens. So these principles serve as the fundamental values and beliefs upon which political systems are built. So the various systems of the world are guided by several principles that determine how the government should function in society, how they should perform their duties within the society. So we're going to begin with the first principle, which is the rule of law. All right, so we have the rule of law. Let's begin. The rule of law refers to the idea that the law is superior to everyone in a political system. It's a constitutional provision that emphasizes the supremacy of the law, equality before the law, and inclusion of the principle of individual rights. So the principles of the rule of law are these three, the supremacy of the law, equality before the law, and the principle of individual rights. So all of these are stipulated in the constitution. They are provided within the constitution of a particular country. They help to emphasize that the law is superior to everybody within a political system. Whether you're a public official or you're a citizen of the country, you are all equal before the law. So let's move on to the next slide. So the idea of the rule of law has its roots in ancient civilization, such as Greek philosophy and Roman jurisprudence. So this is the history of the rule of law. But the modern definition of the rule of law came from the 17th century philosopher John Locke. However, when we are discussing the person who contributed a lot to this principle of the rule of law, we are talking about evidence. So this is a very popular question in your why can jump past question. They usually ask the rule of law can be attributed to which philosopher it is evidence that you would choose. So he's a British legal scholar who is well known for his contributions to the understanding of the rule of law. He explained that political leaders entrusted with the affairs of the states should abide by the rule of law and govern people according to the provisions of the constitution of that particular country. This means that they should always keep in the back of their minds the idea that everybody is equal to the law, no matter the position you have in that society. So when this is respected, there will be absence of arbitrary government. The government will obey the constitution, and they would not rule based on their own whims or their own ideals about the society. They will rule based on the provisions of the constitution. So powers in government should not be concentrated in the hands of a few individuals, but should be exercised by different institutions to make for good governance. So in order for the rule of law to work in a particular society, power has to be distributed among the various organs of government to ensure that not one single person holds all the power in that society. Now let's move on to the next slide. So these are the principles of the rule of law. According to Evidice, he identified three key principles in his influential work, Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution, which he wrote in 1885. So the first principle is the principle of equality. All individuals, irrespective of their status, are equal in the eyes of the law. There should be no special privileges or exemptions granted to any individual or group, and access to legal facilities should be granted to all. So if you are convicted of any crime, you should have access to a lawyer um, in order for you to state your case properly so that the judge, the independent judge, will determine if you are innocent or guilty. This should be the case in every case within that particular society, no matter where you come from, no matter your status. And that principle of the rule of law is the principle of impartiality. The law should treat offenders impartially. 
No individual should face punishment for any offence until proven guilty in court. And no person should be held for longer than 24 hours without appearing before the judge. And this should ap apply to everybody within the society, no matter your status. And that principle is the principle of individual rights. Every human being is entitled to an exercise of fundamental rights and freedoms. And when these rights are violated, citizens should have the right to seek redress in the courts. Only the courts have jurisdiction to entertain such cases. Earlier, we talked about the independence of the judiciary. It is important for the judiciary to be independent so that whenever any citizen of the country have a case, they can bring it before the court, court of law to seek redress. And this is one of the principles of the rule of law. Now, let's move on to the next slide. All right, there are several additional features of the rule of law. One of them is that the law is supreme over every individual in the state, regardless of political or economic status or position. Also, an accused individual should have the right to access his lawyer and other necessary resources to assist in preparing his case. Every individual should have that privilege. Anyone who has been arrested for any offense remains a suspect until he is granted a fair trial. And every individual should have the right to appeal if not satisfied with the judgment of the lower courts. So if you've been given a judgment by a judge of the lower court and you feel that that judgment is not good enough, you, can, you have the right to move on to a higher court to appeal the case. Then the government should rule the people according to the established laws and provisions of the Constitution. Now let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to discuss the limitations to the application of the rule of law. Remember, this is a principle, and sometimes principles may not actually work in a society because there might be certain limitations that prevent that principles from being applied by the government. So these are some of the limitations. One of the limitations is the immunity of some government officials. So while in office, the president or head of state cannot be sued or appear in court, and this undermines the principles of the rule of law, which states that everybody is equal before the law. Additionally, diplomats cannot be prosecuted in a country where they reside. When we're talking about diplomats, we're talking about representatives of a particular country in another country. So in that country where they reside, they cannot be prosecuted even though they have committed a crime. So members of the parliament are also immune to legal action or any statements they make while in parliament. So all of this undermines the principles of the rule of law, which states that everybody is equal before the law. So under limitation is an inefficient legal frameworks. Oftentimes, court cases are delayed and citizens are forced to spend years in custody before their cases can be tried. Also, illegal tribunals that consist of inexperienced and unqualified personnel are often created to try cases, and this eventually leads to unfair hearings and the restriction of individual rights. So we have two um, problems here. First of all, sometimes court cases are delayed so that individuals who are even in innocent are placed in custody before they can be tried before the court of law. This undermines the principle of the rule of law. Also, we have illegal tribunals, which consist of inexperienced and unqualified judges who sit down to judge a case and sometimes their judgments are unconstitutional. All of these are part of the inefficient legal frameworks that lead to the limitation of the rule of law. Also, we have corruption. So corruption within legal institutions can compromise the fair and equal application of the rule of law. Oftentimes, privileged members of the society can use their wealth and positions to influence the judiciary, and this is a limitation to the application of the rule of law. So people who have status, who have wealth, they can use that to bribe those um, judges who are supposed to sit to listen to their case, and eventually they win in the end. So all of this undermines the principle of the rule of law. We also have change of government. When the military intervenes in politics, the rule of law and the constitution are usually suspended. A dictatorship does not allow for the rule of law to be practiced. Individual rights are often abused, and those in power hold supremacy over the people. So in a military regime, the rule of law and the constitution, they are worthless. They do not have any um, power over the people. And because of that, this can be a limitation to the rule of law. Let's move on to the next slide. And that limitation to the rule of law is state of emergency. So during crises, wars, pandemics, etc., a state of emergency could be declared. Fundamental rights and freedoms, e.g. the freedom of assembly, speech and movements, can be suspended and the government can enact laws without the usual legislative scrutiny. And this can lead to potential abuses. Again, it undermines the rule of law because some laws that are, or some policies that are made by the government during these times of crisis can lead to the abuse of the rule of law. 
Then we also have customs and traditions. Traditional practices may conflict with formal laws, and this can lead to inconsistent application and enforcement of the rule of law. In some regions, customary laws or informal justice systems operate parallel to the formal legal system, and this can cause contradictions. An example is the Sharia law that you can see in, not in northern Nigeria. So it undermines the rule of law sometimes, and when some of these laws, some of the judgments are passed by these courts, by these laws, the rule of law may not be respected. Then we have unlawful arrests, detentions, and torture. Torture involves the use of severe physical or psychological pain to extract information, to punish or, or to intimidate individuals. Arbitrary arrests involve detaining individuals without sufficient legal basis. Unlawful arrest, detention, and torture are all violations of the principles of the rule of law. So we talked about how people cannot be given judgments without being tried in the court of law, without giving them lawyers to represent them in a case. But in the case of torture and arbitrary arrest, sometimes they are not offered lawyers or any legal representative to represent their interest. And all of this undermines the principles of the rule of law. Then we also have illiteracy, poverty, and ignorance. When people are not educated about the principles of the rule of law and their rights, it can be a limitation to the rule of law. It can lead them to be easily exploited by those in power. So if you have no knowledge of your rights as an individual, you may not be able to represent yourself in any case. So as a result of that, you can be exploited. So this is another limitation to the application of the rule of law. Let's move on to the next slide. Now we're going to discuss factors that ensure the enforcement of the rule of law. How do we ensure that the rule of law is actually being enforced within the society? One of the ways in which you can do that is through independent judiciary. An independent judiciary is vital for interpreting and applying laws without political interference. Judicial appointments, promotions and decisions should be made based on merits and legal expertise rather than political considerations. So all of this helps to ensure that the rule of law is enforced in society. When the judiciary is independent, they can make their decision based on objective facts rather than political affiliations. Let's move on to another factor, effective legal institutions. Law enforcement agencies should receive proper training and resources and operate within the law. When we're talking about law enforcement agencies, we're talking about police officers. This helps to prevent the abuse of power. To make sure criminal cases are hand handled fairly, Prosecutors should base their decisions on facts and legal merits and not on outside influences. Again, when you employ police officers, law enforcement agencies based on merits, they will be able to handle their cases objectively without external interference. Let's move on to another factor that ensures the enforcement of the rule of law. We also have public awareness and education. Legal literacy empowers individuals to engage with the legal system effectively. A vigilant civil society and responsible media can hold authorities accountable and expose legal violations. So when the public are made aware of their rights as citizens of the country, the rule of law can be enforced within that society. And they can be made aware through civil societies. Civil societies are those societies that help to um, educate individuals on their rights as members of a particular society. The media can also help by ensuring that they uncover any hindrances to the rule of law. Anytime a public official abuses the rule of law, they can expose this to the citizens so that they can be made accountable for their actions. Now let's move on to another factor that ensures the enforcement of the rule of law. We have civil society participation. Civil society organizations are responsible for educating the citizens. They are also responsible for monitoring government actions and contributing to the development and enforcement of laws within the society. So they can act as a check on the government power and ensure accountability. So when they expose the citizens to the actions of the government, by monitoring them and ensuring that they do the right thing, they help to ensure that the rule of law is being enforced within the society. Now let's move on to another factor. We also have government accountability. The government should establish and maintain internal checks and balances to prevent abuse of power. This includes mechanisms for oversight, accountability, and adherence to the principles of the rule of law within government institutions. That's why we have the separation of power. When the legislature, the executive, and judiciary are working independently, and yet they are checking on one another to ensure that each of them do not go past the stipulated um, responsibilities that have been given to them. All of this helps to ensure government accountability. Now let's move on to another factor. 
We have effective remedies and enforcement. So the legal system must provide quick and fair solutions for legal violations. This includes the right to appeal and compensation. Court decisions must be enforced promptly to maintain the credibility of the legal system. We've been talking about court delays and illegal tri tribunals. If all of these are avoided within the society, it can be an effective remedy to help to ensure that the rule of law will continue to be enforced within the society. Now let's move on to another factor. We have freedom of the press. So the press must be free and not be censored. The government should not control dictates to the press. A free press acts as a watchdog exposing government corruption, abuse of power, and other malfeasances. So with the, when the press is free, they can expose the illegal activities of the government. Whenever they violate the principles of the rule of law, they can expose this to the citizens of the country so that they can be informed when they go back to the polls. So now let's move on to the next factor that will ensure the enforcement of the rule of law. We have separation of power. So separation of power creates a system of checks and balances where each branch of government can check on the powers of the others. This prevents any single branch from becoming too powerful and abusing its authority. So separation of power helps to prevent the abuse of the rule of law. Now let's move on to the next slide. So now we're going to discuss a case study of the rule of law. All right, so this particular case study is going to focus on the effect of legal immunity. So Silvio Berlusconi was the former prime minister of Italy. So he served multiple terms as prime minister. During his time in office, Berlusconi faced numerous allegations and charges, including corruption, tax fraud, and bribery. However, his ability to avoid prosecution while in office can be attributed to the legal immunity granted to high-ranking officials in Italy. Berlusconi benefited from immunity laws during his tenure, including the Lodo Schifani law in 2003, which shielded top officials from prosecution. So this is part of the legal immunity, one of the limitations to the rule of law that we discussed earlier. So these laws delayed judicial proceedings until after his term. It's until he finished his term as prime minister before he was allowed to be tried in the court of law. After leaving office, he was convicted of tax fraud in 2012, receiving a four-year sentence, later committed to community service. So this is one of the problems we have with the rule of law being applied in the society. Sometimes an offense cannot be tried. If the person who committed the offense is a public official, he has to finish his term in office before he can be tried in the court of law. And even when he is tried, oftentimes the judgment may not match the crime. As in the case of Silvio Berlusconi, he was only convicted of tax fraud. He was not convicted of other allegations. And he was given a four-year sentence, but later it was commuted to community service. So this is one of the limitations of the rule of law in our society. Now let's move on to another case study. Now we have Jacob Zuma, the former president of South Africa. Jacob Zuma, who served as president of South Africa from 2009 to 2018, faced numerous allegations of corruption, fraud, and money laundering, and accusations of misuse of state resources and state capture. When we're talking about state capture is when you buy several public officials in order for you to be able to influence the decision-making process in the country. So Zuma's political influence and his position as president provided him with significant leverage to delay and obstruct legal proceedings. So he was able to um, manage the courts because he had that um, power, he had that influence over them. Despite these challenges, South Africa's judiciary demonstrated resilience and independence. So in 2016, the Constitutional Court ruled that Zuma had violated the Constitution by failing to uphold the Public Protector's Report on using state funds to upgrade its private residence. It was ordered to repay the state. Then faced with mounting legal pressure and loss of political support, Zuma resigned from office in February 2018 and appeared in court multiple times for the reinstated corruption charges. Then in 2021, it was sentenced to 15 months in prison for contempt of court after refusing to testify before the Zondo Commission, a judicial inquiry into state capture. So he was eventually punished for his crimes. So this shows that there is a little bit of hope for the rule of law being enforced in society. As we can see that Jacob Zuma was eventually convicted of his crime and was given a sentence deserving of the crime he committed. 
So we've come to the end of the first segment of this video. If you would like to continue with us, please go down to the link in the description below. This takes you to the My School website, or you can subscribe for the government topic by topic video lesson. There we're going to continue discussing the principles of governments. So we're going to move on to fundamental human rights. We're going to discuss liberty, separation of power, and checks and balances. I hope to see you there. I believe you're enjoying this content. If yes, please do not forget to hit the like button, click on the subscribe button, and lastly, tap on the notification bell to get informed as soon as we release the next videos.